Hello, and thank you for joining us for this episode of the Friends of the Farm Lecture Series. Each session is designed to deliver a small and in-depth dose of cannabis education. My name is Candace Haas, and I want to thank all of our viewers and our customers joining us um, from the pharmacy, from the pottery, from natural healing centers, as well as all of our friends from all over the world joining us today. Today we have a great webinar with you, um, webinar for you with one of our very special speakers. And this topic is just in time for the spring planning season. As you may or may not know, the successful cultivation of cannabis involves several factors, including genetics, lighting, temperature, humidity, soil quality, and pest management. So to ensure your success today, we have Ed Rosenthal with us to talk about a couple of these topics, including how to choose between feminized, autoflower, or regular seeds, and other things um, that will help um, determine your plan planning strategies for your home growing. Um, as you guys probably know, um, Ed Rosenthal is a leading cannabis horticulture expert, educator, and legalization activist. Reverently given the name the, Gan the Guru of Ganja by High Times, Ed has propelled his effort in legalizing marijuana, leading the movement to grow your own cannabis. He's the author and editor of more than a dozen books, which I know I've owned since like I was probably in my teens um, on cultivating cannabis and social policy, including one of his latest books and one of my favorite, um, The Cannabis Grower's Handbook. I'm so um, pleased to have you with us today, Ed. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, I know that you've just um, traveled the world and gotten back from going to Spanibus and visiting farms all over the world. So I'm so glad to have you with us today. Well, once again, it's a pleasure uh, to be with you and uh, with uh, all the people uh, watching the seminar. That's wonderful. Well, great. So I can't wait to hear what you guys, what you have prepared for us today. Um, I know like we are talking about it's spring. It's the time when people need to be making these decisions and planning their gardens. So I think this information will be really help helpful to everybody. Great. Should we okay. start? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, before you start uh, making your garden, you have to plan it. And uh uh, there are a lot of choices that you have that you have to make, and uh, we're going to cover a few of the choices and uh, uh, to help uh, sort things out. Um, the first choice that you want to make is what varieties you want to grow, and that depends on several things. It depends on the environment that you're placing them that you're placing them in. And it also depends upon uh, the, the varieties. It depends on uh, where, where you're growing them, when you're growing them, how big you want them, are you growing indoors or outdoors? And uh, so the first choice is where are you going to grow? And um, from, the, from that, you can make a choice of seeds and of varieties. And there are thousands and thousands of varieties, literally hundreds and hundreds of seed companies. And I would say that most of the seed companies try to produce really good seeds. A, a large portion of the companies don't have seeds that are uniform. So if you buy a variety a particular variety and you plant 10 seeds, you'll get plants that look some, somewhat the same and somewhat different, sort of like uh, sisters, but not identical twins. And that's, as, that's different as compared with most commercial seeds that you buy that are in cannabis, where the plants look pretty much exactly the same. So, uh, so, um, that is, uh, so in the choice of varieties, there are several thing, things to look at. But um, as I said, the first thing is to figure out where you're growing and look at varieties that, are, that have uh, uh, morphology, that is a shape and growth pattern that's good for your area. For instance, if you're growing in Southern California, you don't want to grow and you're growing outdoors, you wouldn't want to grow indicas because they'll start flowering very early and you won't have much of a crop. On the other hand, if you're in northern areas, 
you don't really want, if you're growing outdoors, you don't really want to grow sativas that won't come in until late October or November. So, uh, so that's a good idea of choice. And then another is um, when you look at uh, seed company catalogs, they describe how big the plants will grow, how fast they'll grow, and uh, what they'll look like. So you want something that's comp compatible. You want plants that are compatible with the space that you have and compatible with the environment that you have. And then uh, uh, another thing is probably the most important thing is what kind of head do you get from that particular variety? Is it a var variety that you like? You don't want to grow. You don't want to grow a variety and then find out that you don't really enjoy using it. So uh, that's another important decision. So now, now what we've done is we've chosen the space. Um, uh, we've chosen the space, and uh, uh, we've chosen um, the varieties. There now. There are three ways of uh, of providing of uh, using. Uh, there are three ways of you of uh, developing plants, and uh, I should say two ways. Uh, one is seeds, and the other is clones. And uh, 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 very often people buy clones because. They're, they've already been started. They're ready to uh, grow vegetatively. And hopefully the clones were taken from clone mothers that were very good plants. And most cloners try to provide only the best quality uh, plants and uh, high performing plants. And what a clone is, it's many people have probably you've at some point uh, at some point, you've probably uh, um, taken a cutting from a plant, maybe a house plant like coleus or begonia, put it in water or soil, and then uh, it grew, grew uh, roots. And what you did there was cloning. And so uh, a lot of uh, di dispensaries and stores uh, sell clones, and they're also available from individuals and uh, uh, they're ge generally available. And the advantage of a clone is you know exactly what you're going to get because it, it's, the clone is an exact genetic replica of the plant that it was taken from. If you, if you wanted all totally uniform plants, uh, you would take clones from the same plant or at least from the same variety and uh, so all of the plants would develop similarly. They look alike. They'd have the same kind of buds. The buds would taste the same, would, uh, and they uh, would have the same qualities. Another way to grow, and uh, I think that uh, it's um, when you're growing larger quantities of plants, it's very often easier to start with seeds either in the ground or uh, in a uh, starting container that would be transplanted either indoors to a larger container or outdoors into a uh, raised bed or directly into the soil. Now, the, uh, the advantage of seeds... Uh, so, oh, let me go into some of the advantages of clones. Um, well, the first thing is that uh, there's, as I mentioned, there's a, there's a uniformity um, because the plants have the same genetics. And that means that they'll all flower at the same time. All the work that you do around them uh, will be all be happening at the same time because the plants develop at the same rate. Then uh, you, you know that if you, it was selected from a particular clone mother, you know that uh, the uh, uh, the bud will be very similar to the, the bud from the mother. There's a slight variation because 
of nurture, where it's grown and how it's grown, but basically it will be pretty much the same. And then uh, the uh, other thing is that uh, clones are easy to purchase and uh, you're ready to go with them. Uh, the disadvantage of clones is that there's a greater chance that it might have an infection or be uh, or have uh, a disease. That that's one thing, and uh, the other is uh, um, that clones generally tend to be very expensive. So that if you're growing a, a group of plants, it can add up to a lot. The financing it can add up to a bit of money. Now, so seeds. Uh, people are often afraid to start seeds, but seeds are pretty easy to start. You can start them under um, under a uh, small LED lamp and uh, get them going. You can buy uh, different types of cubes or planting mixes that are ready for planting, that, that such as uh, Oasis or Rockwell, Rockwell. And then there are others that are made from um, uh, uh, peat moss that um, that they're sterile so that they will support a plant without it, it infecting it. And uh, seed, seeds germinate in three to five days. The, they catch up with clones in two to three weeks. And um, um, the one advantage of seed, some advantages of seeds is that they're much less likely to be diseased or infected than clones are. Now, I'm not saying that a high percentage of clones are infected, but you'd hate to find out that they are. Uh, and uh, other advantages of, of seeds is that they're easy to store and transport. And for instance, if you buy a clone, you know, uh, I have a saying that plants don't wait. And so if you have a clone and you purchase a clone, you have to do something with it right now. And if you, on the other hand, if you've purchased seeds, for instance, a lot of people have started planting later this, in California, have started planting later this year. They're a month to a month and a half later than they ordinarily would be because uh, the weather was, um, was so cold and yeah. so unseasonably cold. And so if you had the clones, that would be a problem. Yep. But, with, but with the seeds, you, ju you just start, let, you, seeds can wait. Yeah. So, yeah. so you, you can plant them at your convenience. So uh, another, as I said, another advantage of seeds is that they, uh, that they're easy to store, to transport. And um, if you're going to breed plants, you generally want to start with, with seeds because you might want uh, females with females. And um, cannabis, uh, only about 5% of the seed bearing plants that flower and seed, only about 5% of them have separate male and female plants. For instance, mm -hmm. Tomato plant on each flower it has a male and the female uh, organs, and uh, other plants have separate flowers, uh, male and female flowers on the same plant. But cannabis is unique. Um, only, as I said, about five percent of the seed plant of uh, seed plants have separate male and female plants, and it makes it easy to separate the males from the females. I have a picture here of. Uh, the, a female, these are fairly de well developed. They're a few weeks into flowering. Female is on the uh, left side and the uh, male is on the right. And the thing about it is that, you know, we all smoke sensomea and that in Spanish, that means without seed. And to be without seed, they cannot be pollinated. So at the first sign of any males, you would remove that male from the population and destroy it. Doesn't really have a use for you unless you're breeding. And we're not going into breeding right now, but generally you're just going to get rid of the males unless you're breeding them. So um, 
in order so um if you so if you remember from a few years ago and you had a watermelon it had seeds in it if you had a tangerine or an orange it had seeds in it same thing with grapes and now if you notice when you buy those fruit they don't have seeds any longer they're seedless and the way that they make them seedless is uh by inducing uh, is by creating all female plants. And that's done by inducing the plants uh, to uh, female plants to have male flowers. And that's done using uh, chemicals uh, usually containing silver. Mm -hmm. And when plants are treated with it, they produce the, the female plants will produce male flowers. But the female plants don't have male chromosomes or, or genes. They only have the female genes. So when they produce the, the female, the, uh, the flowers, the male flowers on the female plants, those, uh, that pollen only has female genes on it. So when it pollinates the, uh, the other female plants, it produces only female seed called often called feminized seed and the advantage of feminized seed is that you don't have to sort out the males so you're doing half the work that you're originally starting with for instance if you're uh, if you were starting with hetero seed you're going to throw half the plants away so half the planting that you did what wasn't useful to yourself but if you start with all female plants if you start with uh, feminized seed, you know, you're only going to have female plants. You're not going to have to look for males. Yeah. And so that's a great advantage. Now, there may be a male might pop up. So you might you have to be vigilant during the time when they're starting to flower to make sure that that there isn't some uh, mutation or deviant plant. But for the most part, you're dealing with um, plants that are uh, all uh, all female and um, it's easy, less work and uh, more secure. So you see, so the male and the can you find the male in that picture? So <laughs> if you can, you realize that those plants are all going to be pollinated. They're not going to have sensimea, and so that's not what you want unless you want to produce seed. So this is, uh, this is what um, all female seed will produce. Now they actually, this isn't a good photo of it because it's not indicating uh, sexuality yet, but all these, all these plants are the result of uh, are the result are from feminized seed, so all of them will be used in the garden. The, this is some clones. As I was saying, it's pretty easy to make the clones, and you could see that right there that uh, you would just take the uh, the, the uh, cut stem, trim trim the uh, trim the uh, cutting, take the cut stem. Put it into the. Uh, this is a rooting cube, a rooting cube, and then in about ten days to fifteen days, you'll have a rooted plant, and that plant will be genetically exactly the same as the plant that it was taken from. This is what those identical twins look like when they're all grown up. Very uniform. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that ma that makes it really easy to harvest. This is especially true if you're growing, uh, if you're growing commercially, whether you're growing a small group of plants or a large group. It's good to be able to take to take everything out at the same time. Obvious, not so much because you're not necessarily interested in the most efficient production but you're interested perhaps in a variety of different plants that might have different harvest dates and come in at different times, have different morpho morphology so that they look a little different. 
and uh, grow a little differently. You might have to give them a little different care, but uh, rather than um, using just one variety or harvesting one variety, you'd be harvesting a group of varieties and giving yourself variety. Just as if uh, you were growing tomatoes, you just wouldn't want to grow one variety. If, I mean, if you're growing more than one plant, you wouldn't want to grow the same variety. You want to grow something a little different. So that though that's so we've been talking about choices about size of the garden that you want, how much sun that it gets. Now here's the thing. In choosing a garden, you should make sure to choose one that gets sun or a garden place or a garden space outdoors. You should make sure to choose one that not only gets good sun during the summer, but also in the fall as the plant is flowering. Because you know that the, sun, the, uh, the angle of the sun becomes more acute so that there's more shadows in the fall. So you want to make, take that into account. Some people, um, for instance, my, myself, I, I have a garden where the where the sunny part of the garden changes over the season. And I grow all my plants in containers so that I can move the containers to different areas of the garden in, in the fall than in the spring, than in the uh, summer. And uh, so that, that's another choice in terms of planting. But so we've covered where to plant, uh, what kinds of plants to plant. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to look at another choice, photoperiodic or autoflowering. And what photoperiodic means is this, that the plants flower, in, in terms of cannabis, the plants flower based on the number of hours of uninterrupted darkness. Mm -hmm. So if the plants uh, start flowering in, uh, uh, so uh, when the, so as uh, fall approaches uh, after June 22nd, which is the longest day of the year, during the summer, each day, the, plant, the uh, daylight, day, day length gets shorter. And when the day length get as the day, day length gets shorter, conversely, darkness gets longer. And most of these uh, photoperiodic plants, and most cannabis plants are photoperiodic, most plants uh, flower when a certain critical period of darkness uh, uh, is reached. And the reason the plants have, uh, have evolved to do that is that this tells them when fall is approaching and they should change over from the growing pattern from vegetative growing to re to reproduction because it's an annual plant and it has to reproduce before uh, bad weather sets in so that it can produce seed so of course our plants aren't going to be producing seed but they don't know it yeah when, <laughs> so uh so when the plant so as soon as the plants start flowering I mean, uh, as soon as that uh, critical dark period is reached, the plants begin to flower. And that's a photoperiodism. And uh, it means that the plants, um, so that, uh, plant, so that uh, generally uh, plants start flowering sometime in July or August. Uh, let's, let's take a look at that. So this is a garden in Hawaii. And in this garden, um, you know, uh, in Hawaii, you don't, there isn't much variation in the light period o over the year. It ranges from about 10 and a half hours to 13 and a half hours of light, or conversely, 10 and a half hours to 13 and a half hours of darkness. And, with that much darkness, most plants will flower if they're not prevented from it. 
And that's why in this greenhouse, you see all those lights hanging down that are only going to, what they're going to do is go on during the dark period and interrupt the dark period so that the plants don't have a long uninterrupted dark period. They only have to be on for a minute or so. But uh, if, if they went on twice, once or twice a night, that's enough to stop the plants from uh, flowering. And basically, the plant, as long as the uh, dark period is on, the plants are building up this, uh, this uh, chem uh, ch ch building up a chemical that will induce them to flower. And as soon as the lights are turned on, the, the uh, chemical gets changed back to its active version, which prevents the plants from flowering. And then the plant, the uh, hour count starts up. So if it never reaches that eight hours or ten hour, nine hours of darkness, I mean of light. I'm sorry. If it, yes, if it never reaches the ten hours of darkness, then it won't flower. So that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. So that's a what. So um, uh, and here's what happens. This is a picture in Jamaica. And um, if you notice, all the plants are one stem. And that's because they never, these plants never got, um, um, never got a short dark period. Jamaica even more than, is even closer to the equator than Hawaii is. So it has even less difference between night, uh, uh, variation uh, seasonal variation in uh, light, uh, light period. So these plants, as soon as they started growing, they started flowering. And the result is a one, one stem plants, which is a very, by the way, a very efficient way of growing. So, so uh, now th this was uh, this was done in Northern California, and this is called light deprivation. Mm -hmm. And what the people are doing, what the people here are doing, is putting a cover over the plants so that they'll begin to flower early. Now, usually, uh, this variety of plant uh, would come in in mid-October, and I don't like mid-October as a good time to come for plants to mature. For this, for several reasons. One is the amount of light that the plants get in October to produce really fine bud. The amount of light that they get in October is not nearly as much light as they would get if they were uh, maturing in August or early September. So, um, so by doing this, the plants stay smaller, but you harvest a lot earlier, and you just grow more plants. So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, one way of doing that. Now, autoflowering plants are based on, there, there were plants that, uh, that uh, evolved naturally in uh, the uh, Caucasus and the Northern Plains of Russia and Romania and those areas of the world. And these plants, uh, you know, the, uh, the growing period in those northern areas is very short. And, these, and so a certain group of plants developed a different way of, of uh, developing flowers. They didn't need a light, light to control their flowering. They just started flowering as soon as they started growing. So as they're growing, they're, they're beginning to flower. And uh, so th for this reason, they, they're called autoflowers. Now, those plants, it was a group of uh, plants called uh, Cannabis ruderalis, but those plants were not very uh, potent. And uh, some people said they didn't like the high. And uh, so over a period of about 30 years, they've been bred the, the Autoflowering characteristic has been bred into other plants, other mm -hmm. cannabis plants, and that's the autoflowering plants that we get today. 
This is another example of auto flowering plants. And these plants are in a uh, indoor situation with, uh, with lights. And the advantage of auto flowering plants with lights is that, as I said, the, the, their flowering is not based on photo period. So you could have give these plants a total of more light each day by having the light on for 18 hours a day, even while the plants are flowering. Very and so, interesting. So they, 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 uh, with, the, with more energy, they grow bigger buds. So I wanted to talk about another choice, which is plant size. So this is my friend, Brian, and he's in Oregon and he has a license to grow 10 plants. So he doesn't want to grow those plants like those Jamaican plants. <laughs> He doesn't want to grow plants like that. I mean, just imagine if he grew, grew 10 of those plants, he, he wouldn't have enough for, for himself. He wouldn't have enough to smoke or to use. So um, uh, instead, he grows larger plants. And the way he grows larger plants, uh, give you the, all the different things that he does to do that. First, he starts the plants very early. So he starts them indoors. He has a little greenhouse that he starts them in. And uh, so he starts his plants. In, he's in Oregon, but he starts his plants first indoors in January uh, when he's starting from seed. And then when he starts from seed, he wants a long taproot. And one of the advantages of a seed plant over a clone is a clone doesn't have a taproot. It just has these secondary roots that come out from it. But a seed plant has a taproot. Now, the problem when most people grow plants from seed and they're growing in a small cup is that it doesn't give the taproot root to travel down. So you could start the plants or quickly get the plants into something like a, a one quart uh, drink cup or mm -hmm. something like that. So the root can travel down. Another way to do it is to use um, tree, uh, tree starters. And that is uh, uh, cubes that are meant for tree to grow um, uh, uh, tree seedlings. And they, uh, they're they usually eight to 10 inches long so that the root can uh, travel, uh, can grow unimpeded. So he starts the plants early and then he puts it, by March, he puts them in a greenhouse and uh, there's, it has some heat to it. And, uh, um, and, then, um, and then he plants them outdoors in, uh, in uh, large um, raised beds. And the raised beds that he uses, and I've talked about this previously, and you can look it up, is he uses a wick system. And um, I'm not going to go into it too much here, but it provides automatic, it's, they're very easy to construct, they're inexpensive to make, and uh, you can uh, uh, Put uh, and you can um, contr have them watered automatically from a central reservoir. In fact, you see this, the plant that you see here is watered automatically from a reservoir raised above the level of the plants. It's on, the reservoir is on a hill and the water travels down and there's a float valve that keeps the amount of water in uh, a tray right below the the uh, the container, the planting container, so that he never has to water. It's watered automatically. So I mentioned that he was allowed to grow, ten, that Brian was allowed to grow 10 plants. There are the 10 plants. <laughs> Beautiful. So, yeah. Now, I think that, I think that these plant, the, the plant uh, count rules are stupid because 
you know, those small plants that I showed you earlier? And they, they, um, those, those plants uh, counted like 10 plants and these, <laughs> these plants are 10 plants. That's yeah. not really scientific or anything like that. I think that those rules, people haven't challenged the, those rules, but I think that those rules have no basis in science, and therefore they uh, they are, are, they're not they're not really um, viable. I think I, what, I think if they were challenged, they, there'd be a problem with them. I there. I'll, I'll give you one anecdote about it. You know, um, years ago, I used, believe it or not, I used to do uh, expert testimony in marijuana cases. Okay. And there was uh, the head narc in California sa said at, at one trial that he couldn't remember the city where it took place. Either It was either Atlanta or Atlantic City, but he couldn't remember. But all the narcs took a vote, and they voted. And this was early in cannabis history that every plant weighed a pound, it, even if it, even if the plant could be put in the size of your hands and it was mature, it would weigh a pound. So um, anyway, uh, we brought in some plants into court, and he said that this mature plant. We, he would count that as a pound. So, um, uh, and this was during voir dire. That's when you question to see if somebody is expert enough to uh, actually give an opinion to mm -hmm. in a courtroom. And after this voir dire, withering voir dire, which he says that all plants are a pound, uh, the judge said, well, I'm not going to disqualify him, but this is going to go to the weight of his testimony. And Charlie comes, you know, like I worked with a lawyer by the name of Bill Logan, who lives in uh, Three Rivers, California. And uh, we had a goal to get rid of Charlie, to get him out of the system. And so... Charlie comes over to me after his testimony. He said, "Got past you this time, Ed," and I gave him this fisheye look, and I said, "Charlie, this is the last time. You're a dead man walking." The next week, he retired. <laughs> and uh, it took Logan and I about a year to do that, but we went after him case after case, building up all of the testimony that he had and examining it and um was was you know he would just make it up as he went along yeah that's horrible and yeah. how many people's lives he you know ruined you know family yeah. torn apart that's really yeah. sad yeah i've had a number of former police say you know i ruined a lot of lives i feel really bad about it i said well have you ever contacted those people and tried to make up to don't tell me how sorry you are unless you've contacted some of those people and tried to make up for some of the harm that you've done them. Mm -hmm. yep. they, they, he, they're not happy when I say that. Mm. Okay, we continue, right? Yeah. <laughs> so this, this was actually done in my uh, uh, backyard here in Piedmont, California, where it's illegal to grow outdoors. So... Bring the indoors outdoors. Well, well, <laughs> Bring the indoors outdoors, you know. Well, well, Let's get a room, right? This is outdoors. There it is. There's mm -hmm. the evidence. Come get me. So uh, anyway, uh, this is a, a four by eight and uh, frame. And you see the white plastic on there? That's white black plastic. And that was used for the same purpose of creating... Um, these uh, one stem plants. Uh, that's another example of that. That's, that's cool. what the plant looked like mature. And you can see at the very bottom, there's the pot. So the plant started at about my knee level and got up, uh, it was about 33 inches mm -hmm. tall, all bud. And 
anybody who is not in, who is where it's either legal, like for instance, if they're growing commercially, or if they're not intimidated by these stupid laws, these this is a way to grow because you get a very fast crop. The plant doesn't spend time building branches or stem, you know, much of a stem or leaves or anything. It's all bud. So as it's growing, it's producing bud. Cool. That another example of something like that. So um, that is the end of my uh, discussion. But I know that people have a lot of questions, and mm -hmm. I'd be happy to take any questions that people have. Yeah, thank you. And, and first of all, thank you for all that information. Um, you know, it, it, you have so much knowledge about cultivation and so much passion and you always share like a couple little tidbits. It's like, oh, that's, you know, how that happens or that's how they do that. And I know from watching the audience and their comments too, you've really helped to kind of explain a couple things and make it really easy, you know, for people to understand. So thank you. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we have definitely have a couple questions here. Um, someone wants to know if you know any chemovars that take less nutrients, if that's something that you've had ex experience. Well, there, there is a difference, and especially the amount of nitrogen that different chemovars take, the cultivars take, and um, uh, generally sativas take less uh, nitrogen than uh, indicas do, and that's because um, they they actually, if you notice, they're lighter colored than the than indicas. They're lighter green, and that's because they have less chlorophyll, so they need less. They need a little bit less nitrogen. Very interesting. <laughs> um, somebody is also asking with seeds. What do you estimate the shelf life for them if they're stored under the right conditions? And maybe if you can also speak to like what the right conditions might be. Well, the best way for long term storage is to keep them continuously frozen. Oh, interesting. And only on freeze. Don't, you know, put them in groups. So if you're going to, you know, take 10 at a, 10 at a time when you package them, package them in tens and don't unfreeze the rest of them and f go back and freeze them again and unfreeze. Yeah. So keep them just frozen and you can store them for many years. Refrigerator, yeah. Refrigerators, I'm not going to... Refrigerators will, especially if the if you use uh, some of those um, uh, moisture packs mm -hmm. to, to dry them. Um, in refrigerators they'll store for uh, several years at least. And um, in a cold, uh, in a cool room temperature in a dark place, a couple of years, start they start going bad after two years, but you. You'll get some couple up to four years, maybe. And when like seeds go bad, it just means that they won't like sprout, they won't pop, right? You'll right. have a time with that. Right. And some things that people do um, if the seeds are challenged is um, they'll soak it in, uh, they'll so soak the seeds either in, sometimes in a, uh, sterilizing solution uh, such as um, uh, hydrogen, 1% hydrogen peroxide solution and store bar, you know, drugstore hydrogen peroxide is 3%. So it would be one part of the, of the solution and two parts of water. And uh, then another way that people use is they use um, um, uh, fulvic or humic acid sometimes and soak them for uh, a day or several hours in that um, and uh, keep the germination warm about 72, 73 degrees. Make sure that there's even moisture but not overly moist. Use a, use a sterilized or sterile soil like if, if you're using one of those uh, uh, planting cubes, Zestero or Oasis or uh, Rockwool, they're, 
they're sterile. But, but you don't want to use like um, an unsterile earth. Or you could use a pasteurized planting mix. And um, th those are all ways of uh, um, helping challenge seed germinate. Oh, very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> um, another person is asking, what are some good cover crops to grow with cannabis to help like eliminate um, pests or lessen pests? Or like, you know, uh, different herbs. Uh, uh, you could plant different herbs between the plants. Like, uh, you know, if you notice uh, the different sages, for instance, rosemary, oregano, and uh, thyme, plants mm -hmm. like that. If you notice, they hardly ever have any insects on them. Yeah. And they're true. good insect repellents. And um, I make a, uh, a pesticide uh, called uh, Zero Tolerance. And that's made out of cinnamon, clove, rosemary, and thyme oil. Yeah. So, and uh, um, so that, and that's very effective. People can make that themselves. Uh, you use, um, I, I add uh, vegetable glycerin and vegetable lis vegetable glycerin and ve and uh, vegetable lecithin, and the lecithin helps it mix with the water and the glycerin gives it a little bit of body and uh, very small amounts of them. And um, you want no more than a total of 2% oils in, in, the, uh, in your mix. If you do more than that, you'll probably burn the plants. So and before you spray, you mix it really well, mix it right before you spray and before you do a quantity of plants, test it out on a, on several branches to make sure that it doesn't burn. If it burns the plants, just add more water. Okay. Will the burn, will, will you see that right away or do you have to like wait overnight and kind of see like the reaction? Two, two days. Two days, okay. Good. Yeah, Thank and, you. and to get rid of, um, an easy way to get rid of um, uh, powdery mildew and uh, to prevent botrytis that is gray or brown mold is to use a 1% pota uh, potassium bicarbonate solution. And um, you can buy it in a store, a few ounces of it for some outrageous price, like $7.98 or something for a tiny jar. Or you can buy it uh, by the pound on the internet and the shipping will cost you more than the cost of the product itself. <laughs> so I, I highly advise to, and uh, um, and you use a, a one percent so solution of potassium bicarbonate, and yeah. you do that as a preventative. Like for instance, let's say it rain, you have buds, and it's it rains right after the rain, you spray it with a potassium bicarbonate. Oh, that's good to know, Chief, for this year, we've had, you know, a lot of rain. It's been unseasonable. So that's a good tip for those that live in climate. Well, weather. you know, you don't have to use it now. It's when the it's in a few yeah. months. Yeah. So if like it was continued to rain like all throughout the year right. and that was something that we're dealing with, yeah. that's a good tip. Um, yeah. I had several questions come through about also pop. fog. That's also good for fog, you know, because oh. because what, um, you know, the spores for these things are all over. They're just, you know, you, if you took a cubic square foot of air, it would have these spores in them. So it, you can't, you know, in an indoor situation, you might be able to clean the air a bit using a UVC light and other mm -hmm. filters and so on. But outdoors, you can't. So uh, the thing is that th those spores will the things that they like they like an acid environment and usually temperatures between 50s and low 70 mm -hmm. in low 70s and um and moist and moisture so if you have fog or rain that's really good environment to for these uh for them to 
for these uh, infections to develop. So if by putting the potassium bicarbonate on the plants, it changes the pH from acid to alkaline, and it hinders the germination of the spores. Oh, thank you. And potassium um, bicarbonate, by the way, is a fertilizer. It's not harmful. It's, okay. You know, you're not you're not you're not going to have to uh, go in with a gas mask on. Okay, that's good to know. It's safer. Yeah. Um, I, had, I had a couple people ask about pots. So they want to know what po what size pots do you use in your garden? Um, and they also want to know like what size pots they should use for photoperiodic plants, if like there's a specific size or anything that you suggest. Well, well, the plant is going to a great extent, this, the size of the container is going to affect the size of the plant. So the plant that you're growing in a five gallon container is going to grow a lot smaller than one that you grow in a 20 gallon container, given enough time. So it really depends on the size of the plants. And if you figure that the plant generally are going to not grow more than double the circumference of the container, the top of the container that it's in generally less. That's interesting. That's a good rule of thumb. <laughs> Thank you. Um, another question. How do you grow one? We had multiple people ask, how do you grow one stem plant? And a good leading question is, do you mention that in your new book as well? Uh, the book that it's mentioned in the most is a book called um, Marijuana Success. Yes. Ask, Ask Ed. And I cover it in there. But I do cover it in a Cannabis Grower's Handbook. But basically it's this. When the plant is at the fifth or sixth set of leaves, before it has had a chance to start growing branches, put it into flowering. Very cool. Very cool. I would love to um, have audience members try that out and send us some pictures so we could see. Um, well, some varieties will have a little bit of branching on the bottom, but others won't. And you could put, cut, you could leave those branches on, you could cut them off. That's cool. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your work with Last Prisoner Project? Yeah. Well, you know, there are marijuana billionaires and thousands of marijuana millionaires. And then there are poor schnooks who are still doing time in prison for marijuana. And it just isn't fair. It isn't right. It, it just bothers, it should bother every person every time they smoke a joint. And Last Prisoners Project, you know, I is was formed by uh, uh, Steve D'Angelo, who's been an activist for 40 years. We've, worked, we've had activist projects together for, for, from the 90s. Mm -hmm. and, um, it, so, um, and we both realize how unfair it is. He, and before he started this, I had an organization called Green Aid. And Green yep. Aid has gone on to doing uh, blockchain theory. So. Very cool. So, yeah, definitely, you know. So this, this let, let me continue with this for just a moment. So okay. Last Prisoners Project, what their goal is to have the last marijuana prisoner get out, the last ones, mm -hmm. and not have new ones come in. And, you know, uh, if you look at the... Uh, the uh, laws at, or the regulations at Hochul, uh, the uh, governor of New York State is trying to put in, they would have a whole new class of marijuana prisoners. So, uh, you know, uh, so this is something um, th that takes lobbying, it takes money, it takes everything to do it. And what I've been doing, I haven't been doing lobbying on it, what I've been doing is trying to uh, raise money for the organization itself mm -hmm. to who have trained lobbyists 
and professionals working working on this. Yeah, and they have a staff of attorneys as well that it's working on yes. these pardons and these paroles and these requests for clemency. So yeah, I would definitely agree. And I would say if there's one thing that you do, you know, in the month of April, you know, um, donate to one of these organizations doing really important work like this, because, you know, I completely agree. And, you know, um, having anybody in jail still for cannabis is, is just, a, it's, it's absurd, but it's unsettling. So and with all our the products that we sell retail, 10% of, of the uh, of the uh, gross goes to the last prisoner project oh, okay. from us. It, it's been tens of tens of thousands of dollars. That's awesome. Another reason to buy, you know, your wonderful books. Um, so that's a good time to mention too. If people wanted to um, purchase one of your one of your books, your many books that you've written, um, how how can they find you? How can they um, buy your books online? What's the best way for them to do that? Well, well. Well, the cheapest way to do it is through Amazon, but the best way to do it is through my company. And what we do is we throw in a lot of pre we throw in premiums when we send out books, and the, mm -hmm. everything comes signed. And ten percent of the price of the book of what they what people order, ten percent of that goes to the last prisoner project. That's and amazing. I will mention that Amazon does not contribute to the last prisoner project. Yeah, that's exactly true. You know, for those that maybe, you know, we're on a budget, you know, that's the only way they can, you know, buy it on Amazon. But it's nice to actually, you know, buy one from you or from your company. Because um, like yeah. you said, you can get it signed and, you know, part of that's going to a good cost. So that's yeah. awesome. And, and we, we put in a bunch of premium things. Yeah, I love your guys' bookmarks. With some of our products, also we throw in free seeds. Ooh. Yeah. So, nice. well, some of it, you know, uh, yeah, we have uh, we um, we have I'm involved in what's called the Million Marijuana Seed Giveaway, and the goal of that is to give away a million seeds in the next two years. So, love it. <laughs> so people can participate. I love it. Please. <laughs> well, that's yeah. awesome. Um, so if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? Well, uh, I, I'm on Instagram and uh, there's edrosenthal.com. And uh, the, if you go to edrosenthal.com, eventually everything comes to me. I actually look at, every, at all my emails, the Instagram, all the stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing with us all of your wisdom and your expertise. Um, this is very timely. Like we like we we're talking about before, this is spring, the best time to plant. But, you know, of course, people can grow indoors. And if you want to find any more information about growing indoors, definitely want to point people back to um, your books. Um, your Cannabis Growers Handbook has information about all different types of growing. So definitely encourage people to check that out. Um, thank you so much, Ed, for taking time to be with us today. My pleasure. Truly my pleasure. Awesome. And thank you to um, your wife, Jane. Thank you to Lily and the whole team there, you know, working together to make this possible. Um, thank you to all of our viewers today for spending time with us and learning about growing your own cannabis. That's a great way to control the quality of your cannabis, um, to help save money and to also, you know, find passion and joy in cultivating cannabis. I think just being around the plant itself is healing. So something I encourage people everywhere to, to try for themselves. You know what I say is that using marijuana may not be addictive, but growing it is. Oh, I love that. I agree completely. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you again. Um, I hope that we were able to share some information that will help you all become better informed cannabis consumers and that this information that we shared will help you find relief. With that, have a great day, everybody. Stay safe and well, and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ed. I'll send you an email, okay? Yeah. Hey, I, I wanted to ask you something. Uh-huh. So, you know the million marijuana seed giveaway? Mm-hmm. I'd love.